Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Hello, early birds. <laughs> Thank you so much for getting up so early and running over to this very early morning session because we are having a great discussion on some of the key issues that the world is looking at closely today, which is called energy amid rivalry. This is an interesting topic, eye-catching certainly, when you have a rivalry thrown over there. But I've been talking to our WEF uh, colleagues. Uh, they're trying to tell me that this is an interesting headline. Behind this is a thorough discussion about how the stakeholders in the issue of energy are going to work together both with their domestic agenda and also with our collective global goals. So I just want to explain the topic a little bit. Having said that, though, it is not just the traditional energy, quote unquote, that we're looking at. We're certainly looking at the development of the new energy and all the discussions related to it. Meanwhile, when we are talking about energy, we're not talking about commodities alone, economies alone. We're talking about real people, real innovations behind all of this. So let's get our conversation started. Ladies and gentlemen, my great honor as the moderator of this session to introduce our panelists. They are coming from different parts of the world and bringing in their opinions from different sectors of our economy and society. My great honor to introduce Kadri Simpson, Commissioner for Energy from the European Commission based in Brussels. And now she's with us here. Good, Good to morning. see you. Good morning to you. Meanwhile, Mr. Shunichi, Miyanaka, who is the good morning chairman of the board with Mitsubishi Heavy Industries. He's based in Japan. He's also coming from the Council of International B Business uh, with World Economic Forum. Good to see you, sir. Last but not least, uh, we are joining here by Megan O'Sullivan, who is a well-known scholar in the field. She is a professor of the practice of international affairs and also director of geopolitics of energy project with Harvard University, originally based in the United States with us here as well. Meanwhile, on the road, she's gonna be, he's gonna be here very soon. We have a, a minister of uh, petroleum natural gas uh, and minister of housing and urban affairs from India. And Mr. Minister is going to join us very soon. Let me start by asking about the latest going on on the European continent. We understand the new policies are churning out as we speak regarding the future of energy, especially new energy. And yet, how is that working together with our global goals, for example, reflected in the results of COP28? Madam Commissioner. Thank you, Edda. And once again, good morning. It's a pleasure to be with you here. And, uh, and indeed, uh, in Europe, we have finalized all the legislative pieces that will set uh, our targets for 2030. So we know what needs to be done to achieve um, a significant share in our overall energy mix uh, to be covered by renewables. Um, we aim for 42.5%. And, um, and doing so, we will prioritize also um, all the technologies that help us to save the energy. Because um, lesson learned from past two years is that despite the fact that European consumers could um, replace lost Russian fossil fuels by um, alternative suppliers, we don't want to do that because that would create uh, unwanted consequences across the globe. Mm -hmm. And we prioritize savings. We did so. In 2022, we saved 18% of uh, gas usually yeah. um, consumed by our consumers in, in average. Um, now, we are at the final stage to set our targets for 2040. And, uh, and that means that we will, um, of course, prioritize renewables, but we will also need all the other low carbon technologies that will help us to cut CO2 emissions. And, uh, and that means that uh, after two weeks, when mm -hmm. we present our 2040 targets, very ambitious targets, uh, we will also accompany this with our communication on um, carbon removals, industrial carbon removals, and we will also launch Industrial SMR Alliance, 
all these technologies um, are necessary um, in the decade beyond 20, 2030. Mm. Well, we're looking at the policy lines. Regarding the policy lines, North America, United States, for example, Professor, where you are based, uh, also have been churning out new policies. Uh, uh, the IRA, for example, is one of those. Uh, so how do you see that is working with the domestic agenda while at the same time serving in, in any way with the global goals we're seeing? How about its implementation so far? Sure. Um, <clears throat> thank you. And it's, uh, it's great to be here this morning and with this group. Good to see you. I actually think you mentioned the IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act, which is the largest piece of climate legislation that the United States has ever undertaken. And it's really, I would say, a great example of how domestic priorities are coming together with actually the rivalry that's in the title of this, <laughs> uh, of this session um, to produce a piece of legislation that is aimed to advance America's uh, climate agenda. And what I mean by that, you have the domestic piece. A big portion of the IRA is actually about domestic competitiveness and about the United States really wanting to bring more manufacturing back to the United States to provide more jobs, a real domestic agenda. But it's combined with the realization that China has become a real leader in the energy transition. And that's going to have a lot of advantages, economic and geopolitical, to China. And the US and its policymakers and lawmakers really wanting to be competitive with China. Those two objectives come together in this legislation that will do the most of any other piece of legislation, as I said, to advance America's objective to get to net zero. So, it's a good example of how rivalry doesn't necessarily have to detract from the path to net zero, but can actually spur us further along. Mm. What, about its, what about its implementation? Details sure. are in the implementation, so sure. we know. No, no. I will go, that, uh, go with that question to Madam Commissioner as well. Yeah. Sure. Well, I mean, as you're intimating, the implementation is really the hard part. You know, putting the strategy in place is generally the easy part. And I would say that uh, on, on the one hand, um, initial uh, buy-in to the legislation and investments made in the renewable energy space, which the, the legislation was intended to spur, have been even greater than anticipated. So initially, the thought was that the IRA, because it doesn't cap the subsidies, um, initially it was thought maybe it'll be $300, $400 billion, but now it looks like it'll be more over a trillion dollars because there's such an uptake in the desire for those subsidies. On the other hand, implementation is really hard, and these are huge sums of money we're talking about. And there are debates and still um, specifications coming out about how this money can be used, what it's subject to, what the Made in America components are mm -hmm. to this legislation. So there's internal debates within the US about it, yeah. um, particularly around things like hydrogen, um, that, yeah. and, and, and then there, are, of, of course, there's a secondary reaction to our partners and allies around the world who are actually less excited about this from their perspective. They see it more as protectionism than they see it as a climate um, a move ahead. That's certainly one of the questions we need to handle. That is, uh, what about the double sword interpretations of uh, all these policies put, being put out? Yeah. Let's go to the industry side. Yes. Uh, business leaders sitting here, we have 800 of them this time at the World Economic Forum. Now, tell me more, sir, about how business leaders are articulating both the grand plans these two wonderful ladies have just illustrated from their parts of the world, and what does it really mean oh. for businesses? Yes. Oh, thank you very much. I'm very much impressed. Uh, the, the, uh, and I he heard the uh, European approach and some uh, cause the, how to uh, overcome that kind of climate change issues. And the, uh, the United States approach, the, I was very much impressed by the IRA's challenge because the uh, one, the European challenge is mainly consists of the, uh, the renewable, renewables and hydrogen and other kind of the pure, yes, green technologies mainly. And, but, and then the, the American approach is also uh, promoting and advocating a lot the hydrogen and the new technologies. Mm -hmm. And the, the, those are the very big, yes, incentives. And the, but at the same time, 
uh, from the viewpoint of the perspective of the uh, business side, the, especially our company, Mitsubishi Heavy Industries, is a technology company. And the, uh, our core business is the energy, uh, has been, uh, I think, the over five decades and so on. Well, mm -hmm. The energy has been the core business. And the, uh, we have uh, promoted and will enhance the multiple, multiple pathways uh, toward the uh, carbon neutrality because the we yes we are we have been working very hard in Europe uh, to provide with some the yes hydrogen related technologies and in the United States we are we have been working very hard to uh, yes supply our and the studies and feasibility studies and the commercialization of the, uh, the carbon capture and utilization and storage system. At the same time, we are yes, exploring the hydrogen business opportunities. But we do need to think about the other countries, the remaining part of the world. And the, there are a lot of yes, uh, companies and regions, they need a little, yes, traditional technologies, utilizing their yes, existing infrastructure, energy infrastructures. So, of course, uh, mainly due to uh, their yes, uh, emerge, uh, developing stage uh, economical situations and so on, they, they cannot afford the new technologies at once. And so we need to yes, uh, provide them with the less carbon dioxide emission or technologies, mm -hmm. uh, like the uh, converting from coal firing to natural gas firing technologies, and then the natural gas with the carbon capture systems, mm -hmm. and so on. By doing so, the, we can optimize all over the world the movement toward the carbon neutrality. Mm -hmm. And it is very uh, important for us. Mr. Miyanaga raised a very important point about the diversity of the stages of development of all economies that we're facing today. So Madam Commissioner, naturally I would not go to you about that. Well, the European continent is looking quote unquote inside, but actually, of course, with the global vision. How are you trying to facilitate or um, articulate what uh, this gentleman have just suggested? How are the Europeans likely to work with these realities of the world while not using the policies as a trade protection tool? First of all, the uh, European Union has never aimed uh, um, to close our borders. Um, we do know that um, right now we are very dependent on imported fossil fuels. And even if we achieve our climate neutrality, we still need some additional green hydrogen uh, that uh, we will not be able to produce ourselves from our trading partners. That means that in the recent years when I was traveling around to find alternative LNG supplies, we always offered our partners sorts of future-proof partnerships. Mm -hmm. um, that means partnerships on hydrogen, but also on critical raw materials. And we have uh, signed many, um, um, uh, many memorandums of understandings uh, across the globe also for raw materials, because we do know that uh, if we finish uh, this very dangerous dependence on Russian fossil fuels, we don't want to end up in being dependent on one single supplier. So uh, we call it T-risking, mm -hmm. creating many um, trustworthy partnerships. And, uh, and on critical raw materials, we have signed these, for example, with Canada and Kazakhstan, um, and with Chile. Um, and many, uh, several uh, African countries. Now, um, European Union is also very diverse. We have 27 member states, very different geographical locations. For example, in northern part, we have lots of uh, potential for offshore wind mm -hmm. because we have shallow coastal waters. In southern part, we have to promote more floating wind. And then we have our neighbors. Many of those are still very dependent on coal. We try to promote renewables by offering them also uh, trade uh, prospects. So um, we are not only supporting the interconnections between European member states, but we have decided also that uh, we will um, support 
subsea cables so that, will, that will connect us with northern Africa. Or um, through the Black Sea with, uh, uh, with um, Georgia and uh, Azerbaijan. So, uh, and we have, we have even closer partnership with uh, Ukraine, of course, and, and with uh, Western Balkan countries. So um, this single market that, uh, that we do have is a very attractive market. Mm -hmm. And uh, by connecting our closest neighbors with us, uh, we are also promoting renewable, uh, renewables in these regions. Mm -hmm. What about in the U.S.? Of course, Professor, don't let me limit you to a U.S. perspective because I know you are the expert in the field. But about that question, uh, we know this is a very interesting year, 2024. Uh, in November, we're going to see something happening in, our, in the country. So how do you see the vulnerability of all the current plans? And what does that mean for all the other stakeholders to plan in advance and look at all the possibilities? Sure. Um, well, it's actually, it's, a, it's an interesting year for the world in that respect. About half of the world's population will be going to elections this year. So it's not just the United no. States, although um, you could make the argument that that is perhaps one of the, one most, of the most consequential. consequential elections that we'll see. And I think there are, there are considerable concerns about whether or not a different administration, a Republican administration, per se, would be as supportive of the IRA-type legislation that we've seen in place thus far. And I think the, the hope and expectation of many advocates of this legislation and this approach is that <clears throat> they are providing such broad-based benefits to US, the U.S. population mm. that they're building constituencies that are not partisan in nature. So um, if you look at a map and you see how these different policies are expected to benefit different states and different communities, there's actually um, a disproportionate benefit expected to red states or Republican states. And so the idea is this hopefully over time will be over even the course of this year, it will be a little less politicized. So I think time will tell, but certainly um, we're moving in the direction where more and more of the population will benefit from some of these programs. And at the same time, it's more and more evident to the US population that climate change or a change in the weather is certainly something that affects us all um, in particular mm. direct ways with the very <clears throat> large um, price tags for reconstruction of storms and uh, other critical weather events that have happened just in the last year. Mm. Could I just say one thing, building Please. on your question to the commissioner earlier, about um, helping the developing world? Because I think it's very, as an American, I'm acutely aware, 88% of the emissions that are going to happen in the future are happening outside the United States. So it's absolutely critical to the world if we are to make this energy transition um, and if we're to do it on the time frame that we anticipate or not anticipate, we hope for, that the developing world needs to have, um, uh, needs to be brought in and needs to be assisted in making this transition at the same time. And so like many in this room, I was at COP28 this year and a big focus on climate finance. And I think the, the focus has shifted to trying to augment the huge flows mm. of a finance that are needed to get to the developing world. But we also have to think about how that finance is delivered and what that finance is for. If you speak to leaders in the Global South, and we hope we'll be joined by the, the minister very shortly, um, sometimes there's a perception that Western entities are want to lend money <laughs> so that de the developing countries can buy goods from Western countries. Well, that's not actually achieving what is needed. What is needed is climate finance to build competitiveness in the global south so that they can be part of the supply chain for a clean energy industry. Mm. And that is the, the kind of the goal, the vision that we should all have in order to make this a more equitable transition and therefore one that can actually happen um, ideally on the time frame that the climate, is, uh, the climate requires. Yes, just as everybody is very well aware, as the debates in COP28 and earlier, a lot of uh, the questions are really uh, surrounding about the traditional emitters, uh, the storage of emissions already piled up over the history by the developed economies, and also the growth of the developing countries. But of course, we're not dividing the world into two, yeah. but rather how can we work as one? I think that is 
what people have realized after several years of great debate, hopefully. But go to you on that, because we see even developing economies, yes. the business partner you are working with, yes. are very diversified. Yes. For example, some of them are raw materials yes. providers for the new uh, so-called new energy. New energy, yes. And uh, for example, some in Africa, some yes. in Latin America, yes. some in Asia yes. as well. Of course, so also uh, North America and Europe, but minority. Yes. Uh, secondly, you also see India and China. Uh, the minister will be with us uh, hopefully soon. Uh, China, I'm originally yes. coming from that country. You see tremendous development yes. of uh, new energy. Yes. By the way, uh, it has already become the biggest exporter of uh, uh, cars and vehicles, and bigger, one of the biggest exporters of new uh, energy as well, solar panel, everything, the list goes on. So very diversified, even yes. looking at the so-called global south. Yes. How do you see when you are doing business with them, yes. when you are lining up your global agenda, how will these factors work into your articulation of the policies and implementations? Oh, the, from, uh, yes. I think the, there are a uh, uh, variety of the uh, wide range of the uh, perspectives, even in the uh, business, uh, private and business sectors, uh, like the financial institute or the trading companies or the or raw material investment uh, investors. Those are uh, those uh, uh, will be are, are yes influenced by the political changes and some rivalries and so on. They should be very careful. Uh, and uh, how to handle with some investment. But I think the uh, technology side, technological uh, solution provider, yes, uh, the, they need to, yes, uh, continue their effort uh, to advance their technologies and improve the more uh, yes, innovations or the encourage the uh, innov innovations and others. And such kind of activities and uh, will yes provide the the developing countries and late coming uh, regions with the a little bit advantage uh, like a kind of the skipping effect because they they can skip some uh, technologies they can just uh, use the new technologies mm -hmm. but I think the uh, but still, it is very yes helpful for them to use and uh, improve the existing facilities. Mm -hmm. At the same time, the jumping effect, the speaking, the new technology adoptions, and then we would like to be the provider of wide range of both technologies, most advanced one and the new technologies and the conventional yes or. Uh, it's a, a, a kind of the, yes, the auxiliary uh, technologies, mm -hmm. but still very important and effective. And then the, I think the, to yes, encourage that kind of activities, we, we should be very, yes, close, uh, well connected with the financial institutions and others to this part should be uh, kept uh, as a long-term investment and then, the, uh, regardless of the uh, political changes and others. Of course, the, the other part, uh, we need, we understand the investors and others uh, can, yes, and be, can be, yes, influenced or could be influenced very much. Uh, then, the, uh, depending on such kind of issues, but the, still the, the fundamental and basic uh, layers of the technology side should be, yes, and the private sector of that kind of uh, engaged in such business. The, we should be very consistent mm -hmm. and, and make our best efforts of the continuing, uh, continued innovations. Consistency and long-term vision. Long -term That's vision. what you're saying, yeah. and implementation, of course. And I'm so glad, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we are now joined by uh, the Minister from India, Mr. Hardeep Singh Puri. Uh, minister is the Minister of Petroleum and Natural Gas and also Minister of Housing and Urban Affairs from his country. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, fighting all the morning traffic to get here. We really uh, appreciate that. Earlier, 
we are all expecting your perspective uh, coming from an emerging economy, a fast growing economy, uh, your um, understanding of the topic today, please. No, let me start by saying that uh, the changes that are taking place in the world, um, we are facing multiple crises. And um, for a country like India, which now has, I think, the largest population in the world, it uh, requires a transition to sustainability without in any way um, jeopardizing or undermining the need to deliver um, uh, basic welfare to a large and growing population. Mm -hmm. Now, let me set the context, uh, do some context setting on where we are just now. We are a close to a $4 trillion economy, but with a lot of developmental challenges. That involves, and it's a, you referred to it as a fast growing, I've also heard the word fastest growing. Well, we are currently, I think the last three quarters, our rate of growth was upwards of 7.2, 7.3%. If you look at the two portfolios that I have the privilege of dealing with, uh, let me start with uh, petroleum and natural gas. If you look at the global scenario today, India's consumption is growing at three times the global average. In the next 20 years or so, India will account for 25% of the energy demand of the world globally, one country. If you look at the Housing and Urban Affairs uh, Ministry that I'm also associated with, uh, we are, and I'm not citing a figure which I uh, have come up with, it's a McKenzie study of a few years ago. India is currently in the position of building between 700 and 900 million square meters of urban space every year, which is the equivalent of a Chicago. Mm -hmm. Now, given these broad uh, pointers, today I think what happens in India is also important for the rest of the world. I mean, I was at Davos, I think, what was it, two years ago, when the uh, Russia-Ukraine military factor was very much in everybody's mind. I said then, and I say that now, that all these new challenges that we have to face, we have to face them pragmatically. And I say this not to provoke anyone, but to just mention, if India had chosen at that point of time not to be pragmatic, we would have had a situation where oil would have gone beyond $200. Uh, Why? Because then India would cannot stop. Uh, we import 85% of our crude. Mm -hmm. And um, we have to deal with issues of availability, affordability, and sustainability. If India had allowed itself to be put into a situation where we were to draw on the same resources, but other parts of the world did not take uh, the kind of position we took. We are acutely conscious of that. And as a result of which, if you look at the uh, LNG market, I mean, you can, you can quantify what the cost has been to them. But today, for us in India, I think it's paramount that we uh, achieve all this, which I mean availability. Mm -hmm. There's never been any uh, difficulty on that. Affordability, yes, I think. We are one of the few countries, uh, Miyanagi-san would perhaps know that. I think Japan is another country where oil prices in the last two years at the bunk have actually declined. Uh, in, in, in India, the cost of petrol over the two years. Why? Because we've had to forego uh, central government revenue. Because at the same time, whilst we were feeding 800 million people three uh, meals of dry ration in a day, something which we are continuing for five years. So I would say that in these new challenges which arise and how we face them, there is a very strong this thing, but there is also a global commitment. We have not allowed our domestic preoccupations to in any way undermine or dilute our commitment to sustainability. Mm. And that's brought out in biofuels, 
We are making rapid uh, progress in what we are doing for green hydrogen, etc. Okay. I see a key <coughs> word that you just mentioned, Mr. Minister, which is pragmatism. Um, how is that articulated and also interpreted, Madam Commissioner, from your side? Well, I just want to comment to that India held last year the presidents of G20, and it was uh, very strongly, uh, um, well, so that India um, um, presented this pragmatic uh, approach. Uh, from European um, Union point of view, um, we did our utmost to avoid uh, implications that will put uh, um, the rest of the world in very bad position. Despite the fact that the uh, gas crisis uh, was artificially created by Russia, this was not a result of sanctions, but it was unilateral decision made by Russia to cut gas supplies to European companies, despite the fact that they had long-term contracts. And um, as a result, yes, European uh, um, companies had to find some alternatives, and um, LNG was a solid alternative. But, uh, but we knew that we cannot cover all the lost volumes from Russia with, uh, with LNG because otherwise it would have created a huge deficit. And that's why we promoted fuel switch where it was possible. We replaced gas with renewables. And just listening now that uh, the demand in India will be grow so fast, um, the cheaper alternatives to cover this demand are always homegrown renewables, just not to be so dependent on imports. Um, that what we did two years ago was first year in Europe when we, <laughs> where we um, produced more electricity from wind and solar than from gas. And last year, 2023, was even better. Uh, we, have, we do have very ambitious plans for our offshore wind, and that means that we have to promote all the actions to, uh, to expand our creeds. And, uh, and I think that this is one um, sector where we can share our knowledge, how to interconnect different markets and uh, how to um, use the existing creeds in maximum. And this is something that we are doing also. Uh, we do have these uh, special partnerships. Mm -hmm. uh, we call them just energy transition partnerships, mm -hmm. where we help members, um, countries across the globe who are very dependent on coal right now yeah. um, uh, to, uh, to opt for, uh, for cleaner alternatives. So we are very pragmatic. We do understand that even if Europe is uh, climate neutral, this is not enough. We, we need to find partners, and we are willing to share our knowledge and our technology. As we all know, Professor, it is not just about, it is really not about political correctness, but really it is about making all the economies beneficial, uh, benefiting from the latest discussion that we are having. But here comes an interesting issue. Uh, raw material is an important one. Yes. Uh, our business leader just mentioned, uh, for example, Let's just say a country in Africa uh, on its way to prosperity, but facing many challenges. But there are also a lot of developing uh, economies in Africa that are doing very well. But what I'm just saying is an abstract example, not to mention anybody's name. It has the best raw materials for some of the renewable energies that we need in the world. We see this tremendous competition looking for these raw materials. But at the same time, people are also concerned whether the old story will be repeated again, mm -hmm. that the, uh, the raw materials will be out of that country for exports at a price, sounds reasonable, but still that country will continue to be poor, which we saw decades already happening. So are we really doing things to make sure those stories are not repeated? If you look at our audience today, they're coming from everywhere. Maybe they have their own stories to tell later in our Q&A uh, session. But this is one of those things in people's mind. We really need to address this. Professor, your thoughts on this? Sure. I think you're addressing a number of things in the in this, abstract in example the, in the, in the, in the anecdote story. Right, which could be, you know, could be conceived as you're talking about the Congo and cobalt or, or you know, there are, are places that really 
are very dominant right now in the clean energy supply chain. And I would say there's a couple of concerns here. One is on the um, <clears throat> on the side of the countries looking to secure those materials in terms of what is required there. And the commissioner mentioned that it's just sensible, pragmatic, uh, strategic, not to be overly reliant on one player in the market, not just for the production of these raw materials, but for the processing as well. And that's where the supply chain actually gets very, very um, uh, constricted is because so many of these minerals are actually processed in China. So they may be produced around the world, but they're processed in one country. And that creates bottlenecks, potentially geopolitically or for natural disasters or for any types of reasons. So I think on the one hand, from the perspective of the consumer, there's the need to diversify the suppliers. From the perspective of the producer, the Congo or another country that, that may have this, um, there is, uh, I would say, an imperative to see that this race to secure these raw materials leads to broader base development and doesn't recreate what has been known as the resource curse in a lot of other countries that have been able to develop and export oil that has come with a certain number of development challenges. And here, um, I'd say we still have a long way to go to make sure that the investments going into these raw material productions are ones which can be broad-based, um, and I think there's a role to develop international standards here so that you can have agreements among countries, and there are efforts in progress, where there can be an agreement if you uphold these standards in terms of labor and other factors, then you'll have access to con concessional financing. Pragmatism so is also what I heard from uh, Mr. Minister. Of course, what you have said is a beautiful picture, um, and yet, Sometimes we know beautiful pictures might not function at any time. So do we wait for the beautiful picture to be drawn up before we act? Or we, do, we will go with the imperfect picture, but work on uh, issues to avoid repeating of the old story? Mr. Minister. Uh, Madam Moderator, I think what the professor said initially is that you combined a large number of issues and you compress them into the question that you put to her. If you are talking about access to raw materials, well, the materials you're dealing with today are strategic uh, minerals or whatever. That may have a slightly different thing, but this whole process of accessing raw materials has been going on for centuries. And uh, I, as a student of history, I mean, you can look at it. What is different now? There are fundamental differences. I think what we have to take into account is today, and I speak from my Indian experience, there are literally millions of people in different parts of the world who require access to clean energy. I'll give you one of our schemes, which is the Ujwala scheme, which involves providing uh, liquefied petroleum gas, LPG, to economically weaker sections of our population. And we've already handed out about 110 million of those connections. Mm. And that the gas that is supplied there for cooking purposes, otherwise they are using firewood, coal, and all this. So if you have to wean them away, and we subsidize it marginally to the, at the point of, it's a consumer's mm. uh, a subsidy. In, we have also taken electricity to every household, clean drinking water to every household. I think there are large parts of the world. Now, if you're talking about extractive industries in parts of large continents where they are rich in terms of minerals, yes, I think we have to ensure that the benefits of that also go down to their population. The professor was mentioning standards. I mean, those have been discussed. I've been a diplomat uh, professional 39 years, so we've discussed labor standards, we've discussed other issues. Clearly, that didn't go far enough. It didn't go far enough. And so many attempts have been made because people mouth those uh, uh, platitudes, if I may, mm -hmm. but we don't act. Now, what do we need to do? I think fundamentally to bring people in, if you're talking about Africa, I don't have no intention of, of Africa, large parts of Latin America and other parts of the world. We need to take those benefits of development to those people. Well said, Mr. Miyanaka. Yes. Oh, the, I think the uh, for raw material, uh, and it is very uh, crucial. And 
and the, I think the to yes, it will take to uh, yes complete the uh, full process of new yes development of the raw materials of the from extractions and the refiner, uh, refinings and smelting and the selection and the smelting and the uh, product manufacturing and then it, all such uh, investment uh, will be uh, yes will become very big will be very big and uh, ta it takes very long and investment recovery yes and and also the most advanced technology should be applied to the uh, I think the new investment and then the I think the uh, there will be a lot of but at the same time uh, we do hope the such kind of technology will be yes uh, supported by the new uh, yes energies and green energies and less uh, yes, uh, carbon dioxide emission technologies and so on and then the uh, such kind of all overall investment will be secured through some international scheme that will be very important because I think the Without that kind of uh, yes, security, uh, the, we cannot uh, devote ourselves uh, for, to such kind of improvement on development and uh, supply the equipment. And I think the, probably the, in the pretty new future, uh, I do hope personally and as a uh, management of business, private sector, the okay. yes, there will be such kind of another scheme, international scheme to secure that kind of the uh, raw material uh, development in the other countries and uh, hopefully in developing and emerg emerging countries. It will help okay. their uh, growth. Thank you very much. I think we have very limited for questions uh, time, uh, but I do want to invite uh, expertise coming from the audience. Mm -hmm. Maybe we quickly have two questions. Uh, uh, at, no, no time. Oh, okay. Um, sorry, everyone. <laughs> well, thank you so much, all the panelists, for your wonderful input coming from different perspectives. I'm sure discussion like this will continue, and it's very important that we are all involved in such discussions. Appreciate it. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.